economic strength is a key feature. Marshalling our economic strength. Marshalling our economic strength is. Marshalling our economic strength is. Marshalling. Marshalling our. Marshalling our. Marshalling our. Marshalling our. Marshalling. Marshalling. Marshalling our economic strength is a key feature of defeating the virus, producing the material supplies and equipment that we need, and they're doing a really fantastic job. We're helping the governors. We had a conference call the other day with the governors, and uh, we allowed the press to join us on the call, and the spirit between us and the governors has been really great. Uh, we should never be reliant on a foreign country for the means of our own survival. I think we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot. This crisis has underscored just how critical it is to have strong borders and a robust manufacturing sector. For three years, we've embarked on a great national project to secure our immigration system and bring back our manufacturing jobs. We brought back many jobs, records numbers of record numbers of jobs. And this really shows this experience shows how important borders are. Without borders, you don't have a nation. Our goal for the future must be to have American medicine for American patients, American supplies for American hospitals and American equipment for our great America. American heroes. Now both parties must unite to ensure the United States is truly an independent nation in every sense of the word. Energy independence, we've established that. And something incredible that we've established. We're energy independent. Manu Manufacturing independence, economic independence, and territorial independence enforced by strong, sovereign borders. America will never be a supplicant nation. We will be a proud, prosperous, independent, and self-reliant nation. We will embrace commerce with all, but we will be dependent on none. Above all, we know that the best thing for our economy and the world right now is a very, very powerful victory over the virus. Every day, the American people are showing the unity and resolve that has always defined the character of our nation. In New York, citizens are using 3D printers to make hundreds of face shields. They're making them by the hundreds. In Texas, businesses and churches are uniting to collect gloves and thermometers for hospitals. In the selfless actions of our amazing citizens, we're seeing enduring strength of our magnificent nation, a spirit that can never be broken, and a victorious future that can never be denied. It never will be denied. Now what I'd like to do is uh, perhaps ask a person who has really established herself as uh, maybe the world's great expert on what she does. Uh, if I could ask Deborah to come forward and say a few words, and then I'll ask uh, Tony to come up and speak, and then our vice president, and then we'll take a few questions, and we'll do it quickly, and uh, we'll probably see you again tomorrow. So, Deborah, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think those of you who heard the town hall, we are continuing to accelerate testing at a record rate. Um, we now have 370,000 tests that have been done. Um, majority of those, over 220,000 in the last eight days, which of those of you who have been tracking the South Korea numbers, put us equivalent to what they did in eight weeks that we did in eight days. This was made possible because of the HHS team working together, bringing together the strength of the FDA with the CDC and the, under the leadership of Secretary Azar. 
We're very proud of those numbers, but we know that we have to do more and we continue to accelerate in testing to ensure that the, those who need the test are tested first and have access. As we talked about yesterday, we're working on the ability for people to take their own sample. That does not mean home testing. That means taking your own sample in the front of your nose um, with available swabs into normal saline that can be transplant transported to the laboratories. That will allow and free up all of the drive-throughs to be very sparing on PPE, because you'll be able to do that with gloves rather than the full PPE outfits. This will allow for more of that PPE to be dedicated to our hospitals. Um, I think those of you who are tracking this epidemic closely, like I am, you will begin to see that there is encouraging results coming out of Italy. Um, we are impressed by the, the decreases that are seen in mortality, the number of people succumbing to this illness, and the number of new cases. Our new cases will continue to surge because we're still working on our backlog, although we will be in touch with the laboratories after this press conference to really find out how many are still in backlog and how many were run in the last 24 hours. Until we can get into a 24-hour cycle, we're going to have disproportional number of new cases compared to the actual new cases. And we will let you know when we've reached that equilibrium. Finally, and I know Dr. Fauci will talk about this further, we remain deeply concerned about New York City and the New York metro area. About 56% of all the cases in the United States are coming out of that metro area, and 60% of all the new cases are coming out of the metro New York area, and 31% of the people succumbing to this um, disease. It means, because they still are at the 31% mortality compared to the other regions of the country, that we can have a huge impact if we unite together. This means, as in all places, they have to be following the presidential guidelines that were put out eight or nine days ago, and this will be critical. But to everyone who has left New York over the last few days, because of the rate of the number of cases, you may have been exposed before you left New York. And I think like Governor DeSantos has put out today, everybody who was in New York should be self-quarantining for the next 14 days to ensure that the virus doesn't spread to others no matter where they have gone, whether it's Florida, North Carolina, or out to far, far reaches of Long Island. We are starting to see new cases across, new, across Long Island that suggest people have left the city. So this will be very critical that those individuals do self-quarantine in their homes over these next 14 days. How are we going to self-quarantine if the president just got through saying today? that he wanted the church pews to be full by Sunday, by Sunday, Easter Sunday. I tell you what, the more and more I hear this, the more going to the river or going to the lake Sounds better all the time towards getting away from this chaos. And I know there's going to come a time that I'm not going to be able to escape the chaos, especially if it hits right here in my own little neighborhood. And I've tried to help them by warning them and giving them a heads up towards the, severe, the severity, severeness of all this going on in China. And he just went through one or not the other. And we're, we're hearing mixed messages coming from the president. Is to make sure they don't pass the virus to us. So they're still talking about self-quarantining. I don't know where these big ideals come from pertaining to everybody being, filling the pills up, pule, pules up on Easter Sunday. I don't know where that big ideal come from. I mean, you can wish in one hand and poo-poo in the other and see which one fills up the quickest, if that's what the president is doing. Yet if he says that he's wishing or hoping, then he needs to be very, very clear in defining what he's talking about, that he's wishing for this or he's hoping for this. Because you can hope in one hand and, you know, reality hits you, you, you may be lacking. I mean... Sometimes hope, I mean, hope is a good thing. And, and we should always have hope. 
But to think that this is going to be turned around in just like in the next seven days, that's, to me, that's ludicrous talk. That's just my own personal opinion. And it didn't cost you nothing to hear it. Others based on the time that they left New York. So if they've already are four days out, then it's just 10 more days. So I thank you if you help get that message out to others. Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, uh, I want to just talk very briefly about two or three things. First, the issue of testing and how that has really changed the complexion of the approach that we're going to be able to take. We write, you know, testing was an issue. We had many questions of testing in this room for a number of times. Now that we literally have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of testing out there, there are a few things that we can do with that. One of the things is that when we make policy about what we're going to be doing with the rest of the country, particularly those areas that are not hot spots, we need to know what the penetrance of infection is there. So we need to put a light on those dark spots that we don't know. We have to act policy-wise on data. And we're going to be getting more data, a lot more data. The other thing is that the areas of the country that are not hot spots, that are not going through the terrible ordeal that New York and California and Washington State are going through, they still have a window of a significant degree of being able to contain. In other words, when you test, you find somebody, you isolate them, you get them out of circulation, and you do the contact tracing. When you have a big outbreak, it's tough to do anything but mitigation. We have an opportunity now that we have the availability of testing to do that. So you're going to be hearing more about how we can inform where we're going, particularly because we have the ability to test. The second thing is I just want to reiterate what Dr. Berg said about New York. It, it's a very serious situation. They've suffered terribly through no fault of their own. But what we're seeing now is that understandably, people want to get out of New York. They're going to Florida, they're going to Long Island, they're going to different places. The idea, if you look at the statistics, it's disturbing. About one per thousand of these individuals are infected. That's about eight to 10 times more than in other areas, which means when they go to another place, for their own safety, they've got to be careful, monitor themselves. If they get sick, bring it to the attention exactly. of a physician, get tested. Also, the idea about self-isolating for two weeks will be very important because we don't want that to be another seeding point to the rest of the country, wherever they go. And then thirdly, just one, one just comment about, about drugs and the testing of drugs. You know, you heard yesterday about drugs being out there that physicians on an off-label way can prescribe it to give people hope of something that hasn't been definitively proven to work, but that might have some hope. I don't want anybody to forget that simultaneously with our doing that, we're also doing randomized clinical trials on a number of candidates. You've heard about candidates, but there are others in the pipeline where we'll be able to design the study and over a period of time, particularly since we have so many infections, we'll be able to determine definitively, are these safe and are they effective? We're talking about remdesivir, other drugs, immune sera, convalescent sera, monoclonal antibodies. All of these are in the pipeline now, queuing up to be able to go into clinical trial. So I'll stop there and talk. Thank you, John. Good job. Harry, how about just a quick few minutes on uh, how we're doing over the hill? Thank you, sir. We're, made, we're gaining great progress on this phase three legislation. Negotiations continue. We've had continued reports. Uh, I've been up there with Secretary Mnuchin. Secretary Mnuchin continues today with uh, uh, Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, checking in with the President. They're getting closer and closer. They expect to vote as soon as possible. I, I just want to walk through a, a couple of key points. This legislation is urgently needed to bolster the economy, provide cash injections and liquidity and stabilize financial markets to get us through a difficult period, a difficult and challenging period in the economy uh, facing us right now, but also to position us for what I think can be an economic rebound later this year. We started the year very strong. 
And then we got hit by the uh, coronavirus in ways that probably nobody imagined possible. We're dealing with that as best we can. This package will be the single largest Main Street assistance program in the history of the United States. The single largest Main Street assistance program in the history of the United States. Phase two delivered the sick leave for individuals, hourly workers, uh, families, and so forth. Phase three, a significant package for small businesses. Uh, loan guarantees will be included. We're going to take out expenses and lost revenues. As the president said, eligibility requires uh, worker uh, retention. We will maintain the people eligible, will maintain their payrolls during this crisis period. And on top of that, we will have direct deposit checks of roughly $3,000 for a family of four, and that will bridge to uh, enhanced, plused up unemployment insurance benefits that will essentially uh, take those up to full wages. This is one, two, three, four. You know, a strong workforce requires strong business. You can't have a job without a business to work for. And the hope here is that the companies that were operating very well at the beginning of the year when the economy was in good shape, we will help them and their employees get through this tough period so they will come out the other side, let's say this uh, later this spring or summer, and we'll continue their operations. That's the key point. Now, well, that sounds more practical. But whenever you have people telling people that they're not allowed on the beaches, and 72 hours later, you have the same person that gave out the order to get them off the beaches and get them out of public sight as far as dining and ball games and etc. And then you have him come back and say, well, I want the church to fill the pool, or I hope that maybe he said hope. He may have said hope. It, it gives mis mixed messages towards the severity of everything that's going on. We don't need to be led down the road in a make-believe fairy tale. The American people deserve better than that. And like I said, whenever the president mentions what he mentions, I hope to God that he's very, very clear in saying, I hope or I wish versus the reality check of where we're actually at. Well, naturally, everybody hopes that come Sunday, on Easter Sunday, that the pews are full. But I really don't think that's conceivable right now in that happening due to the fact that this is the last part of March. And if I'm not mistaken, if I read my calendar right, Easter comes a little later this year towards the first part of April. I'm going to leave it at that. I don't want to hear no more. I've had enough heartache for today. I think the main kick in the head today was hearing where the Olympics got canceled. To me, that was just breathtaking. Absolutely mind-blowing. Don't forget, there's income tax deferrals. For individuals and corporations without interest and penalties, their student loan interest and principal deferrals without any penalties. And finally, I want to mention the Treasury's Exchange Stabilization Refund. That will be replenished. It's important because that fund opens the door for Federal Reserve firepower to deal a broad-based way throughout the economy for distressed industries, for small businesses, for financial turbulence. You've already seen the Fed take action. They intend to take more action. And in order to get this, we have to replenish the Treasury's emergency fund. It's very, very important. Not everybody understands that. That fund, by the way, will be overseen by an oversight board and an inspector general. It will be completely transparent. So. The total package here comes to roughly $6 trillion, $2 trillion uh, direct assistance, roughly $4 trillion in Federal Reserve lending power. Again, 
It will be the largest Main Street financial package in the history of the United States. Liquidity and cash for families, small business, individuals, unemployed, to keep this thing going. We're heading for a rough period, but it's only going to be weeks, we think. Weeks and months, not going to be years, that's for sure. And hopefully pave the way for continued economic recovery uh, after this uh, uh, crisis uh, departs. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I want to stop. I do want to weigh in on one thing. Right now, our democracy is at stake. And the reason why I say that is because at the failing of our democracy over here in America would just be to no end how the communist-controlled countries would point her finger and say, you see there, you see there, our system was a much better system towards the communist system. So we're at a very crucial time in our history pertaining to our free, fair, open democracy. And I don't know if anybody else can see this or not, but it's as if we're being tested. We're being tried. You know, whenever you're talking about the numbers getting on up around $6 trillion, added on to $23 trillion, well, we automatically went way over the threshold in maintaining anything on the on the uh, interest pertaining to the national debt. So looking at it from that perspective, it's an automatic grim. It's an automatic uh, Achilles heel. It's an automatic Trojan horse because we will be going over that threshold quickly because of all this. I'm still sticking to my guns. And my guns was in 1988 that communism has died and we as a society have the fair, free, open choice of being able to elect our officials and those that doubt, those that hold dominance over our lives, regardless whether it be a federal official, a state official, or a local official. I still stand strong to the original desire, our dream, our ideal, that democracy is better than not just hypocrisy, but democracy is better than communism. Because right now, we as a society here in America are being tried. And the reason why we're being tried is because of all these interruptions that has happened in the past, I know, three administrations, possibly four, that has put us in a very, very precarious situation right now towards us being $23 trillion to begin with. So there's no doubt they're going to have to engineer a new system. And there's no doubt we're looking at the pivotal point to where the digital age will exceed any other currency above and beyond even gold and silver. Now I realize right now gold is skyrocketed. I think it's higher right now than what it's ever been. It's like something like $2,200 an ounce. I don't know what the price of silver is. And I may be off a couple hundred dollars because it may have went up again. But the last I looked, it was around, give or take, around $2,000 an ounce. According to the Bible, eventually they will take their gold and silver and throw it into the streets. Because basically it will become worthless as far as monetary, using it for bartering. Now there's no doubt gold and silver will always have a certain value because we use a certain amount of it in our digital lives pertaining to our phones and our computers and the things that we do. So to say that gold or silver will lose its 100% value 
um, you're losing track of what the Bible had predicted about gold and silver. It was basically stating that the gold and the silver and the American currency and the yen and the euro and the Bitcoin and any other type of monetary uh, currency out there is basically going to become worthless. That that was what the verse was basically saying. Uh, because back even back in the Egyptian days, gold and silver was always treated as being top quality. Silk, furs, food, This was way before they created plastic. This was way before they created methanol. This was way before they created all these other inventions that mankind has created. So every time mankind creates something, it puts another value on something else that didn't really even exist at the time whenever that scripture was given. So because today has been a very, very troubling day in regard to the Olympics, and I don't even know if the president's even going to mention the Olympics, because as far as I'm concerned, that's bad news. That's just about as bad news as it would be if you told me that a typhoon just got through hitting in a third world country and killing over 100,000 people, or, or a, a tidal wave, an Asami. Just an earthquake hit and just got through killing over 100,000 people. To see where the Olympics have been shut down, it does something to our link in regards to a universal planet. And I don't know if others can identify that or understand that or see that. It would almost be like taking NASA and the Apollo and all the other things that all the other nations has fought for towards being involved on a universal stance and saying, okay, we're no longer going to fluctuate towards going up into space. There's not going to be no more, no more flights into space. We're going to do away with the, with the, with the, uh, space station. And, and it's just going to be each country for himself. That would be almost as sickening as seeing the Olympics shut down. And I'm not saying that the Olympics is more important than human life. Don't get me wrong. Human life has always been the most valuable thing on the planet because you cannot replace human life. And you for darn sure can't replace it with any type of currency. But I think my viewers understand what I'm saying, that whenever you take away that unity between the, the nations... Whenever you take away that unity between the countries of something that is so universal, it really speaks volumes about the magnitude towards what we're going through right now, not only here in America, not only over in China, not only over in Spain and Italy and Germany and all those other places, but it speaks volumes. It speaks volumes about what the planet is going through right now on a monetary as well as a medical as well as a biblical health conscientious form. Good luck to all of us and shalom.